Today we are dropping in to visit the season of Advent, which marks the beginning of a new church year in the church calendar. Each year we work our way through the major moments of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, ascension. But before all of that, we start in this liminal space of Advent. The scripture we read today are traditional texts that uh, begin our Advent season. Isaiah gave us images of the heavens being torn open, nations trembling, mountains quaking, and an angry God. And then Mark paints a picture of the sun and moon being darkened, stars falling, the powers shaking, angels being sent out. You see why we don't sing Christmas carols at the beginning of Advent, right? (laughs) It doesn't quite fit the aesthetic, okay? (laughs) In fact, the section of Mark's gospel that I just read is known as the Little Apocalypse. The Little Apocalypse because of the way it resembles the book of Revelation, also known as the Apocalypse of John, right? Now, you're not alone if the word apocalypse conjures up images of the end of the world, zombies and doomsday preppers, barren landscapes. So what does that have to do with Advent, right? Stick with me. The Greek term apocalypse, this will be a quick nerd out, I promise. The Greek term apocalypse just means the uncovering, the unveiling, the revealing It's only in modern times that it's taken on that connotation of the end of the world. In the world of scripture, an apocalypse was just a dramatic shift, right? A disruption of life as we know it. God revealing, uncovering God's self in some dramatic way. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, Isaiah writes. He's praying for an apocalypse, not the end of the world, but a change, a renewal of the world. And that's what Jesus is talking about in this weird section of Mark, too. A sudden revelation, so world-altering that it shakes heaven and earth. What I say to you, I say to all, Jesus says, keep awake, waiting, watching, keeping alert, ready for an apocalypse, a revelation of God, a surprising inbreaking of God's presence. Those are the themes of Advent season. And really, they're the overarching themes of God's people throughout history, all around the year and the world. The kind of waiting that we're talking about here is not like the minor annoyance of waiting for your DoorDash to arrive or the candles to finally get lit. not like the waiting to sing Christmas carols until mid to late December, though I do think that does help us get in the Advent spirit a little bit, that frustrated waiting space. But it's, it's not like waiting at the doctor's office when your appointment is running late. It's more like having a disease and waiting for a cure that hasn't been invented yet, right? You know, that kind of waiting. Waiting for your loved one to come out of surgery. Waiting for your kid to get home in the middle of the night when they aren't answering their phone. It's a kind of desperate, sometimes hopeful, sometimes uncertain waiting. In the Isaiah reading that Carly read so beautifully, we heard one piece of a longer communal lament where Isaiah is crying out to God to look down, to remember them, to come to them. And in this prayer, the people ask some really demanding questions of God. They say, where are you, God? Where is your salvation? Why do you harden our hearts against you? The prayer ends with a final unanswered question. Will you continue to keep silent? The people of God want an apocalypse, a revelation of God, God's presence among them, because God feels really absent to them in that part of their story. But in Isaiah, they don't get one. And I think it's important, because I know we're moving to Christmas next week, but it's important to pause here and affirm 
that this kind of waiting, hoping, questioning, doubting is a totally acceptable and familiar mode of faith for God's people throughout history. You're not doing it wrong. <laughs> if that's where you are, you're in good company. Questioning God, lamenting the experience of God's absence, holding doubts about God's salvation, those things are part of our holy tradition. Waiting without certainty, with skepticism even, is still an act of faith. Isaiah gives us permission to hold a whole range of hope and lament, anger and longing, all at the same time. Mark's little apocalypse also looks forward to that inbreaking of God's presence. And the Christians that were reading this or hearing it more likely in the first century knew that Jesus' life, death, resurrection was a revelation of God, an inbreaking, the inbreaking, right, of God's presence in their world. But their hope must have felt very unfinished. Right? Around the time that Mark was written, the Roman army destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. God's judgment on the unjust rulers of the world had not yet come. These new Christians were wondering why Jesus had not returned to set things right and what they were supposed to do in the meantime. Right? They're figuring it out. For all of Christian history, not just Advent season, this has been a major theme of our faith, waiting watching, hoping, questioning. Jesus says, about that day or hour, no one knows. Beware, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. Keeping awake, what Jesus asks us to do, right, doesn't mean knowing a bunch of right things about God. Actually, Jesus says, you're not going to get knowledge about God or about what is happening in the world. Not even Jesus has full knowledge. Keeping awake is not about moral perfection or about confidence or competence of any kind. Keeping awake means being on the lookout, watching, and expecting to see signs of the apocalypse. Right? No, not the end of the world. The point is not to check that the sun is still shining each day or to keep an eye out for angels on the horizon, or zombies for that matter. The point is that while we wait, signs as big as the shaking of the powers of the heavens and as small as the sprouting of leaves on a fig tree point to God's presence, God's inbreaking, even now. So keep alert. As you wait, watch for ways that the powers of this world are being disrupted. Sometimes these little apocalypses are loud and painful, like protesters in the street fighting for the lives and dignity of our black siblings after police violence, or blocking the progress of pipelines that threaten indigenous people's sacred waters, or queer hymn sings in the halls of the Texas Capitol as lawmakers vote against the lives and well-being of trans folks again and again. Y'all, each of those are mountain-shaking signs of the structure of the world being disrupted, even just for a minute, even just for those moments. Maybe more often the little apocalypses begin quietly like a bud blooming on the fig tree that Jesus points to. A moment of gratitude and beauty in creation, a full moon. Did y'all see that this week? It was amazing. A sunrise or maybe a new blossom in your garden. The unwavering presence of a good friend when you're in need. That's a sign of God, y'all. The freedom of deconstructing harmful theology and setting it aside, building your faith anew, these are little apocalypses, signs of God's presence breaking into the world in little things, in you. What other signs do you see? What other ways is the world disrupted, invaded by God's presence? Maybe it's 
the pure delight on your grandchild's face when they see you, or the aha moment that you had in therapy, or the words I love you from a friend or a loved one in a moment when you didn't feel so lovable. These mini apocalypses, flashes of God's kingdom, can happen anywhere. Each year during the season of Advent, we lean into that sacred space of waiting and watching, questioning, being wholly unsatisfied with our world, maybe even unsatisfied with God. And in that space of not yet, of messy humanness, of climate catastrophe, of seeming hopelessness, in that space, we practice noticing the little apocalypses, the little revelations of God, the little flashes of divine that we see in our midst. Once you've started noticing, and you can name them, practice that, the next step is to tell somebody what you've seen, right? Show somebody else that moment of divine gratitude or presence. And then if you're feeling really apocalyptic, which I know some of you are very apocalyptic, if you're feeling really apocalyptic, see if you can play a part in a little revelation of God. How can God break through into our world through your hands, through your feet, through your voice, through your generosity and care? How can you be a part, big or small, uh, in disrupting the powers of the world? Maybe it's a prophetic no to sexist or racist remarks could be a prophetic yes to whatever dream or calling God has put in your heart that seems too big. Say yes anyway. Maybe you could throw a wrench in the cycle of resentment in your family by offering an unexpected apology or an unexpected moment of forgiveness. Maybe you could offer a fresh meal and a kind word to our guests at God's family dinner. There are a million ways, I know you're thinking of lots, that you can, you can do this week. A million ways for God to be revealed through you. So be creative. If you think about it, even right now, in this space, we're all participating in a little apocalypse, a disruption of our week, of our weekend, of our schedule, our busyness, our productivity, those American gods that it's so hard to disentangle ourselves from. When we come to our church family and we proclaim that God is good and just and peace-loving, when we take a deep breath and pause to watch for God, whether we find her or not, we are participating in a revelation breaking through. Celebrating Advent, that is one way that we disrupt the calendar of the world, intentionally creating a sign of God's time invading our time. Together, we sit for four weeks, we push pause on the consumer-driven holiday season, even if just for an hour on those four Sundays, and then you jam to your Christmas music on the way home from church, that's totally fine. For that one hour, we practice waiting with hope seeking peace in a violent world, finding joy even in darkness, lifting up love that holds us together even when we're falling apart. That is what Advent is about. So friends, as we begin the cycle again every year, we come back to Advent so that whenever our world feels like it's falling apart, whenever we feel lost, Whenever we aren't sure what we believe or whether we have faith at all, we know that that space is not just allowable, it's holy. And even in that difficult space, signs of the beginning of a new kind of world are all around us. May you keep watch as you wait, beloveds. Amen.